Okay, good morning. I guess we'll start with uh, a little bit about why we're doing this, why we think it might be worthy of uh, documenting the history. If you look back at what uh, we've all seen here as the Friends of Connect and as, as staff and employees, you know, there's a lot of history of what the club was like when it started. You know, the whole discussion of the Long Island Railroad coming out here, Snedeker's Tavern, that whole early era, late 1800s, early 1900s, and so on. And then obviously, when, the, when this property was turned over to the state, there's plenty of documentation about how that happened and uh, why it happened and, and what goes on here now. But there's that period in between where there's not a lot about it. And one of the reasons was that taking photographs was for, for, forbidden, all right? You never walked around with a camera here, and that was one of the rules. And so there were very few photographs about that era when it was a private club. And I worked here from 1965 through 1969, and then part-time a little bit after that. So, uh, but what I wanted to start with was to give you just a little appreciation of what this area was like back then. Well, one thing I want to reference is this book that was done by ha Harry Havemeyer called Along the Great South Bay, From Oakdale to Babylon, The Story of a Summer Spa. And if any, if any of you are familiar with it, it talks about all the great estates that existed in this area. And that needs to be underscored here because those properties and the way that this area was back in the area, the era that I'm going to talk about, which was I was born in 49 and went to work here in 65. So at that time, you cannot imagine what this area looked like. Right? Obviously, there were no convenience stores. There were no box stores. There was no traffic. All right? <clears throat> there was no Long Island Expressway. Okay? There was no Connecticut. There was no such thing as Connecticut High School. When I started, we had one school in Oakdale on Montauk Highway, and after that you went to Sayville. And this whole area, because of what's illustrated in this book, was still in the hands of all these great estate properties. All right? The area, for example, if you were to go to Hexter Park, that whole area, which was called uh, Country Village Estates down there, that was not there. That was all woods down, all the way down to Hexter. And I started in kindergarten and the, on in the Montauk uh, School in East Islip on Montauk Highway, which was K through 12. All right, there were no housing developments. The Oakdale Shopping Center was not there. The houses in north of there were not there. That all belonged to the Bourne Estate. The, all that area was the Bourne's farming area. And I consider my father somewhat of a pioneer because of a couple moves we made during our life. But he, he bought two acres out of the corner of the Roberts estate, all right, which was Pepperidge Hall. And we built our own house there. So we lived in the woods, and all of this area was nothing but woods and farmland. And the tie that I want to uh, uh, focus on here was that the people that lived in the area realized how important this entity was in terms of the local economy. And uh, it supported people as far as workers that worked here. It supported people as far as the tradespeople that came here to do work, carpenters, plumbers, delivering oil, all these people. But again, it was a tiny, tiny community. East Islip and Oakdale and West Sable were all tiny little places. The road here at the entrance, you could go straight across from here. It connected to what is Montauk Highway. There wasn't even a light there. It was just a crossing. There was one traffic light down there. And I lived down on the corner of Lincoln Drive and Homestead Road. Used to ride my bike here in the morning. You hardly wouldn't even see a car. You'd ride along here and come in. So uh, I was fortunate in that my mother went to school with Gilbert. And uh, you know, I, I was always interested in hunting and fishing. And I said, I've got to work there. That's what I want to do more than anything. So fortunately, my mom was able to get me a job here through her connection with Gilbert. And we had other connections as well, because again, the people that lived in the area, it was a small town. I mean, you knew everyone, everyone knew you, you know, maybe not personally, but you knew who they were, who lived in that house, that house, and that house. All right, and so the oil delivery man that came here lived on the same block that I grew up on, on Greenwood Avenue in East Islip. And again, it was a very, very small town. So <clears throat> how do I know that I started here? Well, Sue, fortunately, has been able to 
salvage and I, uh, a lot of stuff that Gil, Gil had. And I said to her, please don't throw anything away without me seeing it. Because what Gil had in his, his, his hands was that, that part of history when the club was the Southside Sportsman's Club and then turned over to become the Connecticut River Club and ultimately the state. And so thanks to Sue, she gave me lots of boxes with lots of mildew papers in them, but I am enjoying going through there. And some of the materials I have, whether we can look at them this morning or not in this, these windy conditions, will support things that I'm going to illustrate and talk about. And so as the Friends goes forward from this point, this video may be one tool in documenting that history. Some of these documents and papers will be other tools that you can use to uh, substantiate exactly what went on here. So here we have a payroll form from 1965, but there you go. It penned in, Craig Kessler started on the 28th of June for $1.25 an hour, five days a week, all right? And here are the other people that worked at this club. And again, very, very interesting personalities all, all right? But we had the, the house staff, and we'll talk about some of these people as we go around. The house staff, as we call it, Bill Spadaro from Sable, Mabel Parkin, Gene Waslinski, George Collins, John Bahanek, and Catherine Buchik. The, the cooking staff in the kitchen, all right? Patty Stafford was the chief, chief chef. Francis McGinley, Blanche Shea, Maria Huck, and Catherine Grief. And then the guys like myself that were outside, and that's why we're gonna start in this building right here. William Kolonek, who lived right in the, this area up here for some 39 years, I believe it was. Paul Tuma, Frank Masick, Rob Wolfarth, John Buchek, Kenny Hubbard, Craig Kessler, and then the hatchery staff, which I won't spend too much time on because you, know you know a lot about the hatchery through, since it you know, still exists and so forth. But the hatchery staff were people that lived in those buildings and there's one building that is no longer there. So they, were, they lived there full time, took care of the trout and so forth. And then Gil Bergen and Dolores Bloomgren. And I never had quite the appreciation for Dolores' role, but as I went through all these things, all the record keeping, not only payroll, but all the other things that we're gonna talk about, she had a very important role here. And I did, I did see that she was the second highest paid individual behind Gil, so she was compensated accordingly. But anyway, so some of the names on there were part of the crew that I dealt with. And this is where we started our day every morning, all right? This, at, the th at that time, was known as the guides room. So this is the way the day started after I got off my bicycle and left it here. We come into what at that time was known as the guides room. And there are two little rooms here. This area has the lockers in it. And lo and behold, number one, this was my locker here. And in it, I kept everything from fly rods to shotguns to waders to clothing and so forth. So this was an important part of my operation here. Behind you, there is a black, little blackboard. This blackboard existed back in those days. And every morning, because Gil got up at about 5 in the morning, he would write on this blackboard what we had to do. And he always signed it GB. That's the way he signed everything. So it might say uh, mow the trails up to the hatchery. It might say trim the Forsythia in front of the old annex. It might say uh, get some hay bales uh, out of the top of the uh, barn, whatever it said. We were jacks of all trade. And back then, we didn't worry about equality, all right? We did whatever we were told to do with a smile on our face. And it was a great place to be, and that's what we did. The second room, again, part of the guide's room, was originally where the fellows that I mentioned, like Willie Kalanick, Frank Masick, uh, Paul Tuma, and Bob Wolforth, would wait and stage themselves to go out to go fishing with one of the members or to go hunting with one of the members. This was their place to stay, hang out, if you will, have lunch, have coffee, whatever. There was a table in the middle. They'd play cards or hang out, whatever. I never spent a lot of time here because all these people were you know, quite senior to me. I was a little kid, and they were 50, 60 years old and had a lot of experience. Eventually, this became known as the tack room because Gilbert fell in love with horses and the whole environment of doing that full time. And so one of our jobs at some point was to turn this into the tack room. And we threw 
Paul and Frank and Willie out, and they had to go somewhere else, and Gil took over this room as the tack room and had saddles, bridles, all kinds of horse stuff in here from at least 1967, uh, I would say, on, because his uh, horsemanship continued for quite some time after that. Okay, I just want to talk a little bit about Willie Kalanick because Willie was sort of second in command. All right, Willie lived above the barn here, and uh, he had uh, his wife, Helen, and he had uh, one daughter, Bobby, who uh, was pretty much gone by then. She was about 18 or 19 when I started, and I think she moved out. But Willie was uh, second in command because every morning he would get up at 5 o'clock or so, and he had a golden retriever named Wren, and he would basically patrol the property around here at 5 in the morning. He'd walk around, go over to the mill tail, maybe go as far as East Pond, walk around the buildings here, check everything out. Now, one of the interesting things is nothing was ever locked here. Not one building, not one room was ever locked. You could go anywhere you wanted. So that's just a sign of the times in how this place was private and secret and everybody was, was trusted when we were here. All right, if we look at the horse barn for a moment, uh, I'll just tell you that that was sort of second place we might end up. Originally, if you notice the line of windows down there, this was actually a horse barn. Those were all individual horse stalls lined up on both sides. But when, by the time we were here, uh, there were no horses being used here. There was simply tractors, cars, and other stuff. We had two or three old cars that we were allowed to drive around the property. And again, I, where I grew up on the two acres down there in the field, my father taught me how to drive by the time I was, I don't know, 10, 10 or 11 years old. So when I got here, I knew how to drive. So Gil said, can you drive? I said, of course. So we had cars in there and you'd take a car, all right, go up to the hatchery, go up to the kennels, go wherever you needed. So we had two or three old cars. We had a Jeep, the little army Jeep. We had a uh, Jeep pickup that we used and we had three tractors in there. One was a, a front loader with a bucket, and one was a big farm wall tractor, and another was a Ford tractor that we used for farming some of the property. So that's what the, the barn was all about. And I think Gill's Chrysler station wagon stayed in there until about two, 2010. But uh, I remember when we, he took me one time down to uh, Kennedy Airport and he said, what's different about this car? And, I didn't know. He said, why are the windows closed? And I said, I don't know. He said, because we have air conditioning. So it was one of the first cars that had air conditioning, his big Chrysler station wagon. So Gil, uh, you know, Gil and I were, were, were close. We were, we were good buddies. And the reason for that is that the other men that I mentioned, Willie, for example, and Paul, Paul was uh, the oldest of the bunch, they were 10 or 15 years Gil's senior. And so, you know, again, there was a little resistance about what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. You know, I'm a guide and I don't rake lawns and so on and so forth. But Kessler, he did everything. So Gil, you know, Gil and I got along great because he would say, go do this, go do that. And I did it, you know, with all the energy and, and vim and vigor that you could possibly muster up. So we became good buddies. And I'll give you an example of some of the shenanigans that we used to get involved with. And again, I was, you know, obviously athletic and, and willing to do all this stuff, energetic. I was interested in the outdoors, interested in birds, interested in shooting, fishing, and so forth. So someone, as I got here, was talking about swans on the, on the, on the main pond. And so about, uh, I started on, the, on, what I say, June 25th. By July 19th, Gil said to me, can you catch some swans? I said, well, I, don't know, I guess I can. So we got in a canoe. And uh, Kenny Hubbard, who worked here, was paddling, and I was in the front with a big fluke net. And we went out, and there was a bunch of cygnets on the main pond. And sure enough, again, being athletic and energetic, and go get them, I caught all the swans with a, with a uh, scap net. And here's an invoice from June, June 19, 1965, from John M. Olin, who was the, a member here, and he was the owner of Winchester Western, and he had a plantation in Nilo, in Nilo, or Nilo Plantation in Albany, Georgia. And here's an invoice for shipping five mute swans from the Connecticut River Club to Georgia for uh, a total of uh, $21 uh, for shipping, 20, uh, and $6 freight total uh, value $300, but I'm not sure we were supposed to do that, but we did it. And that's why I'm telling you, 
Gil had me doing all kinds of things that uh, we, uh, we all enjoyed and had great fun. And so uh, I became his sidekick. And quite often we'd get here at five in the morning and say, let's go birding or something. And uh, again, I was all in, all in for everything. So let's take a look at some of the other buildings right here. This is officially and historically called the Ice House because back in the days before refrigeration, they stored blocks of ice that were cut and stored here with sawdust that would keep them cold for quite some time. In my era, this is where we kept the firewood, and firewood was a big job for, for me and for the other guys that, wor that worked here. By the time we're done, you'll get a look inside this whole thing. But uh, when we first started, gathering firewood was kind of a happenstance thing. You know, we had Willie might cut, have a tree go down and he'd cut it up, or Frank might cut up a tree somewhere, and it kind of went like that, and we'd be responsible for getting the firewood and putting it in here. Later, I'll show you where we put it into the, into the main house. But one of the things that occurred about halfway through my tenure was that uh, Maria Huck, who lived, who worked in the in the kitchen, her husband Eric, came here. He's a, a little old man from Sweden, hard worker, soft spoken, you know, just worked hard. And he was given the task. And you know, and I look through these records, and I find no you know payments to him or anything else. So I don't know how that went on, but he was given the task of cutting firewood up the, up the hatchery road. And he would go up there every day with his little lunch box, and he would stay there from eight in the morning till four in the afternoon till when Marie was ready to go home. And that was our, those were our work hours, by the way, eight, eight to four on a normal, normal day. Eric cut so much firewood that we filled this building right to the, right to the top, all right, and right to the front. And our job, when he was cutting, was to bring all that stuff down. And we had that old Jeep truck, and two of us used to bring the firewood down. And as the stack got higher and higher, again, we were told to do it. We did whatever we were told. We weren't worried about OSHA or anything else. We'd have to climb up on top of that stack and throw wood up on top of it. And this whole thing was full of wood, all right? And it was amazing, and that was kind of good ecologically as well because he was cutting a lot of wood up there which was a concern for, for fires and for other issues. Now that's the sad part of the story after I left I heard a couple years later Eric was killed by a car riding his bicycle from East Islip to Oakdale right on the Big Bend at Westbrook Lake there. So that was kind of a shame um, obviously. But when he was here start grabbing firewood was quite a task. So while this says ice house, when we were here, this was the woodshed. Over here, we have another building. All right, I see they've done some modifications to this by putting a, a floor in here, but in the old days, there were stairs that went down. So again, cool air sinks. So there was a somewhat of a basement down here. And this was where we would hang the ducks from duck shooting. And now, of course, that was one of the activities that was you know, most important in the wintertime. And it's actually my favorite sport and, and career, if you will. And so I really took an interest in what was going on here. When we went out duck hunting, there were lots of rules that were put out as to when you could shoot ducks, how you could shoot ducks, where you could shoot ducks, the, the blinds that existed and so forth. And so they had all the dates when duck shooting would occur. They only shot three days a week, Saturday, Monday, and Wednesday. And they would record everything that was killed and by species and who shot it and so on and so forth. And we would, thanks to Sue, I have all this good stuff. We would put a tag like this on, on our bag for the day. It might be two mallards or two mallards and a black duck or whatever. And these tags would be Mr. Mosley, two black ducks, one mallard. Would hang down there until such time as one of the other kitchen folk had, had, would take the birds away and have them cleaned and processed. And just as an example, all right, in 1969, again, I was hoping that I'd have these kinds of information. In 1969, they shot a total of 611 ducks, all right, and it's all down here by black, duck, black ducks, 89, mallards, 502, so on and so forth. And the um, each year, the reason there were more mallards is each year we would uh, raise, raise some mallards. We would buy day-old ducklings, uh, either probably about 1,000 typically, sometimes 500, sometimes 1,500. And we would, one of my jobs during the summertime was to raise those ducks from day-olds up to maturity. 
and at about eight weeks old we would take them and we would divide them up into groups and we would spread them out into the different shooting areas around the club. For example, East Pond, East, Pond, East Brook had a blind, Lower, Lower Brook, Upper Brook, Canal, so on and so forth. So we would take the thousand ducks and divide them up into little in groups of a hundred or so and then from, the, from eight weeks on till later to their maturity when they started to fly we would feed them out at those sites, which again was a task that we would do. We'd have take bags of food up to these different places, drive around. It might take you two hours to drive the whole property and feed those ducks. So again, we had a, a multitude of tasks. It could have been mowing, could have been feeding ducks, could have been raising ducks. But again, when, when called upon for either fishing or shooting, we had the responsibility of being a guide, quote unquote. And that was, of course, the, the real reason that this, this club existed. So, um, so that's just where we, we hung the ducks while they were being. Now there was a water tower, it stood right up here about 60 or 80 feet, and it had a ladder on the outside of it. And of course, what do young guys like to do? We would climb up the ladder and get on top of that and sunbathe on top of the water tower which had a flat top and so if you want to get uh, you know Archimedes or whatever it was got close to the sun and his wings melted or whoever it was uh, that's what we were that's what we were doing we wanted to get up as high as we could and it was fun and of course you could see all over the property from there I don't know when the water tower was taken down but I'm sure city water has been brought in here and there was no longer a need for uh, getting your own water. This actually was a, a very uh, important thoroughfare right here. This road came right through here and went right past that uh, fire escape and stairway and uh, out to the, out to the uh, road there and connected. So this was a very important road and then and it went around this way and you could you would circle around if you wanted to drop something off at the kitchen you went around that way and so forth. So. I don't think that this metal staircase, I would, I would swear that this metal staircase was not here. It was probably just a wooden staircase came down. And the reason I know that was because one of the first times that Gil told me I could drive, he had a little Jeep and it had a tire mounted on the side. And I said, I, sure, I could drive. And I took off and I came around here and the tire hit that post right there. Boom! And the little Jeep flew up in the air, but we lived, we got away. Gil kind of frowned and then laughed and said, uh, that won't happen again, will it, Kessler? And I said, no. Nope. So that was the fun we used to have. No need to fill out any reports or uh, file anything with the state. Just on we go, next job. So let's take a look over here at the carpenter shed and the pheasant tower. Okay, this, this is a carpenter shed and it certainly was another uh, area of uh, a lot of activity for us worker bees. Um, the carpenter shed had obviously tools for carpentry and repairing things and everything. But this is where we stored all the grain that we used to feed the ducks and the pheasants. And so we would get deliveries of a thousand pounds of grain or whatever. They, they would maybe more, maybe two thousand pounds. I have some invoices to reflect that. So again, our job was to come in here and, you know, get a bag of corn, go out and feed the ducks, you know, and uh, Willie again lived right there and he would come out to the back door which was right here and so we had plenty of time spent in the carpenter's shed but this was always where grain was kept for that. Willie used to actually feed the deer right on this field here which was kind of, sounds kind of ridiculous now because we have so many deer but back then deer were not that common on Long Island I'm sure you've all heard the stories of how they have expanded all over Suffolk County so this was one of the few places that had that had deer and Willie used to feed them at four o'clock every afternoon by throwing some corn on the ground here and, and some ducks would come in as well but mainly he was feeding the deer here and it was kind of uh, you know an attraction if you will if somebody came around with their grandkids or whatever they'd stop and see the deer these roads were all unpaved they were all dirt roads here um, and again this was a main thoroughfare above that horse barn this was one of the worst days of work I ever had here above that horse barn you'll see that door into the hayloft and when Gil got into his horsemanship he had as many as uh, three possibly four thoroughbreds here at a time and so one year he decided in the middle of August he was going to get a delivery of hay from upstate and so 
a semi came in with, I don't know, it had to be hundreds, maybe 500 bales of hay. And of course the semi is about as tall as that trailer that you're looking there. And the door is another three or four feet up. And the difference between hay and straw is hay is what they eat and it weighs about 80 pounds a bale and straw is what they sleep on and it weighs about 30 pounds a bale. Well, we had to throw those hay bales up into that thing while his truck was waiting to leave so you couldn't stop and take a break. We had to keep throwing hay bales and it was hotter than get out in the middle of August. That was one of the worst days of work that I ever had here but you take them as they come. It was trigger. All right, and Trigger was allowed to roam the property. He was a big white, uh, it wasn't a Clydesdale, but uh, uh, something similar to that. And he was blind in one eye, all right? And he was given to the club, I don't know how, from, uh, from a, a man in Sable. And uh, they let Trigger roam the property and he would go in the barn at night and then he'd come out and he'd roam the fields and everything. And so there was a saddle back there and again, Gil loved this spirit that I had, so I said, can I ride Trigger? He says, well, you can ride Trigger if you can catch Trigger, all right? So Trigger was scared because he only had one eye, and if he heard, he heard something coming up on that side, he would bolt right away. So Gil finally told me, you've got to sneak up on his blind side and throw a lasso around his neck and you'll get him. So one of the stories that was, uh, I managed to, <clears throat> catch trigger quite a few times I rode him quite a few times but one time I decided I or I asked Gil can I go sleep up at Bunce's overnight and I want to take trigger and I want to take that big western saddle which belonged to Eddie Brown and it had you know a thing for the ropes and it had a scabbard for shotgun and it had everything so I put that on on trigger and uh, I, I had a thing of hay tied to the back of the back of the uh, saddle a frying pan, my fly rod, everything. We, I went up to Bunce's and the shack up there had two parts. It had a, kind of a, a house and then it had kind of a, an ancillary fenced in area. So I took the lasso and I put it around there so that it would be a fence to keep Trigger in overnight. And I caught a few trout and I fried the trout and we had dinner and then I decided I was gonna go to sleep. And, well, all night long, Trigger kept leaning against that rope and it would pull the whole building and it was going. <laughs> so I couldn't sleep because first of all, I was afraid he was gonna pull the whole shack down and I'd really be in trouble. And second of all, the noise was just, you know, too much to bear with. So that was a great camping out experience with, tri with uh, Trigger. And then all of a sudden, Gil decides to get Tony, who was a quarter horse. And uh, so we had Tony for about a year and we got our first English saddle and bridle and so forth to ride Tony, even though he wasn't really a thoroughbred. I think he would have been a, a Morgan or something. I don't know what he was, but quarter horse. I'm not that familiar with horses. But anyway, Gil would ride Tony and once in a while I'd get to ride Tony also. And one time he had me race Tony out here in the kennel field. He said, do you think you can beat me across the field. And I thought to myself, well, if I can make it to that maple tree, I said, yes. I said, yeah, I could beat you. And so he, <laughs> he said, all right, you ready? One, two, three. And so what I did on three is I scared Tony. I went, ah, and Tony reared up for a half a second and I took off. And that half a second gave me just enough time to make it to one of those maple trees that lined the garage. And I ran around the back of it and grabbed the first branch and climbed up there like a monkey. And Gil was laughing his head off, of course, and could have caught me if I had to go another hundred yards. But anyway, so that was that. Was that. And then all of a sudden, Gil gets more interested in horses. And he had at least four different thoroughbreds. And Patty Stafford, who was the chef, lived up on Sportsman's Road up on the backside there. And so she had two or three horses. And so I'm not quite sure how this was all justified. I guess you're allowed to have, you know, side hobbies or whatever, but pretty soon the horse thing got to be a pretty major part of what was going on here. But we always panned it off on the idea that we were on poacher patrol. And this made sense because now we weren't burning up gasoline and we were sneaking up more quietly on the poachers and it was all environmentally friendly and everything. So every afternoon at three o'clock, we would saddle up the thoroughbreds and Patty who would cook here for breakfast and lunch had gone back to her house and she'd get her horses and we'd meet 
down the fire line somewhere, and from 3 o'clock till 4.30 or whatever, we'd ride the whole property on these thoroughbreds. So, but let's go back to where it used to be the pheasant pen. So, as you know, uh, the history of Lyme disease and the deer tick, and now these Rocky Mountain spotted fever diseases and ticks and everything that's evolved are all part of our changing environment. But the first deer tick that was ever discovered here, if I could say this on camera, was in Willie's butt cheek, all right? And he came out one morning and he said, I have this tick embedded in me and it's not a dog tick. We all, all us kids used to get dog ticks all the time. You'd go on this grass, you'd come home, you'd have 10 or 12 ticks on you, you just pick them off you, you burn them with a match and they're dead. But this little tick, and that was had to be around 1966, Willie said, I have a deer tick stuck in me. And he, he took them out, and that's the first time I ever heard of a deer tick. And you know the rest of the story, you know. They grew in, in, in their abundance and their, their whole distribution on Long Island, and the other ticks have followed suit. So the answer is we had a lot of dog ticks, but so did everybody else. I mean, we played in the fields in Oakdale, and we had ticks on us all the time. And they, they stick in you, but you, you pull them out and you burn them with a match, and it was kind of fun to kill them, you know, so. But that's the story of the deer tick when they first showed up. So, uh, we got to go a little bit further. This was, a, this was also a road right here because we would drive the utility trucks down here to take care of the pheasant hunting operation. This grove of white pines was much larger. Oh, you, you can see it over here. You can see all the stumps that are there. This was a pretty thick, uh, nice, beautiful grove of white, primarily white pine. There was some spruce as well. But anyway, the pheasant pen started right about here somewhere and was a major part of our operations as well because pheasant hunting was a very popular activity. So there was a pen here that was about as wide as this, but about two or 300 feet long. And we had nothing in there during the summer but in the fall, we would start to buy pheasants from the various places. In 1969, they bought 4,193 pheasants. And they came from places like Spring Farm and Sag Harbor and Milan Farm, upstate in Red Hook. And it's all documented here as to when they came in and how that went on. Here's an invoice from the place in, Sag Har in Red Hook and it says 2,000 pheasants to be delivered at various times from September 1 to December 31st, 1970. So that was a contract they had for bringing pheasants. So all the pheasants came here as adult birds and they were kept in these pens. And the pheasant shoots, which are illustrated on, these, on the sheet like this, talk about the rules and the dates for pheasant, big pheasant shoots, which were primarily a big social event. And we're gonna take a walk down to where they occurred so they would be on Saturday morning. So on Friday afternoon, if we could get out of school or whatever, we'd come over and help. If we didn't, Willie and Frank and those guys would do it. And they'd have to catch up out of the thousand pheasants that were in here. They'd have to go in there and catch 100 or 50 or 200 or whatever we were going to use on Saturday morning. They'd put them in crates. They'd get loaded on the back of a pickup truck. And they'd be ready to go on Saturday morning. So. Uh, of course, the feeding of the birds was, again, the use of the corn that was over here in the carpenter's shed. Birds had to be fed and watered and so forth, and Willie did a lot of that because he lived right here, but we sometimes got involved with it. So that's what the pheasant pen was all about. And then, again, uh, Gil built the paddocks here around the pheasant pen. And geese were quite uncommon back then as we look at this guy walking right here. All right, there's probably only 20 or 30 geese on the property back in that, in that era. So the pheasant pen ran down this way, all the way down to the end, and we would catch the birds at, at this far end down here. But let's just take a quick look at these two buildings, and then we'll go around and come back to the, to the new annex. So in the interest of no ticks, we'll walk all the way down here and cut through here. Okay, nothing too terribly different from what we've already talked about, but obviously some more outbuildings here. Uh, this building was pretty much vacant when I first came here. There might have been a piece of equipment in here or something, but then through the horse program, we ended up building three big box stalls in here, which again was one of the many tasks that we did with a big smile on our face, whatever it took, we did it. So 
we turned this barn into the primary horse barn for the thoroughbreds. And there were three, there's three big box stalls in there. And then we built this, this paddock out here so that the horses could, could come right out the side, side door here at, at, at times. Other times we'd lead them, bridle in a lead, and take them over into the big paddock and put them out there. So uh, in the winter time, <clears throat> we used to use horse manure to keep the water pipes from freezing. And so uh, the heat builds up in the manure pile and keeps uh, quite, a, quite a hot temperature in there, warm temperature in there compared to outside temperatures. But right in the corner here was the, was the uh, underground water and there was a big pile of horse manure on top of that and straw that would keep that going. But the horse manure, all right? We had, we had a manure spreader, which was kept in this barn right here. And a manure spreader, if, if you don't know what it is, is it's a, basically a big open wagon with a, a uh, conveyor belt and a big wheel on the, on the back that is driven by the, you know, the uh, power of the tractor as you go forward. So we'd have to clean out the stalls and fill the manure spreader with manure. And then what we would do, and one of the things that uh, the state ultimately asked Gil to cease was that we would take and spread the horse manure all the way up the hatchery road, both sides. And we would put a bag or two of cracked corn in there and as we went along, it would throw out the manure and the cracked corn. And you know, his feeling was that it was building up the soil value by fertilizing naturally. But we were also feeding the pheasants at the same time, so we were throwing this corn all the way out. Because in addition to the tower shoots, which we'll talk about in just a moment, they used to do what is known as a pheasant walk-up, which is just walking through the field, two or three guns adjacent to one another, and one of us would go as a guide with a dog. So the, this field was used and all, all up this side of the property, all about halfway up to the hatchery, and then across and down the other side. So holding the pheasants up along the hatchery road by spreading the corn was, was a good thing that worked for the shooting purposes. The birds that got away would gravitate back into that area rather than flying across the pond or doing something else because they knew they could find some, some food in that area. So, Again, it, it turned out that a lot of the things that we did evolved around the, the horse operation one way or another, but it was all, it was all good fun. So, um, and then this, the rest of this barn was just uh, used for storage of equipment. You know, maybe uh, the yellow tractor sometime was back here, this, the, the uh, manure spreader, maybe a plow or something. The question was asked about what, what areas did we actually farm? We farmed the main field out here, by planting uh, crops that were used for pheasant cover, if you will, places that the pheasants would hide. Millet, sorghum, we, never, we didn't plant anything to harvest the grain, but uh, that was another one of my jobs. Gil showed me how to use the tractor with a plow and a disc and a tooth harrow and a, a cedar, and so we would seed that field out there, and that was one of the primary areas where we'd start the pheasant hunts and it was kind of nice because it had that cover in it and it looked like a it looked like you were out in a natural pheasant field whereas the rest of this piney woods really isn't pheasant, pheasant cover per se but because we were releasing pheasants all the time you'd find them all the way around you would find them along that hatchery road because of what I mentioned before there was another structure right here called the corn crib which is interesting because it was a bona fide corn crib. It was shaped like a corn crib. It had slats on the side so that the air would go through to dry out the corn. And it had screening to keep the vermin out. But I don't, not, certainly not during my tenure did we ever grow corn or keep whole corn or anything like that. So possibly back, you know, in the period in the 20s or 30s or whatever, they might have used that as a functioning corn crib, but it was not, it was there, but it wasn't functioning when I, when I was here. And since gone into disrepair and been removed. <laughs> Maintaining the, back in the woods back there is, a, is an old road grader that we got, got. And, you know, Gil would pick up certain pieces of equipment that we needed from time to time, whether it was a disc or a harrow or a grader. But maintaining the dirt roads all around the property was, again, another main function of, uh, of all of us that worked in the field. And uh, at times we would have to grade them down because the puddles were, were pretty significant. At other times we would just use a piece of chain link fence that we would drag. And the reason that we would do that 
was to look for poachers because if we dragged the road with the chain link fence, anybody that walked on those sandy roads would be caught right away. You just follow their tracks and say, oh, we got two kids running right down the road here. Oh, they went this way, they went that way. So we would, we would grade out the roads with a chain link fence so that you could have fresh time at all times. We also would, you know, patrol them in terms of, you know, any fire danger or so, something like that. I do have an interesting letter in here. Uh, you guys should, friends should have it. It tells the story of one of the wildfires that ran through the club in uh, 1983, I think it was, uh, 63, it was before, right before my time. And uh, one of the members stayed here throughout the whole fire. It describes everything about the fire companies that came and what, a what areas were burned and stuff. I have it in here and I'll, I'll give it to you, but it's pretty interesting. But the threat of fire was always, you know, pretty, pretty important. All right, we better keep moving along here. So this was called the kennel field and the kennels you know, I'm, I'm sorry that the kennels are gone, but I realized they had no, no use or function, you know, here as the, as the club. So, uh, but the kennel buildings are gone. But again, I spent a lot of time up there and took great pride in learning all about the world of retrievers and field trials through Gill's involvement. And uh, it's something that's continued, you know, through my life as has waterfowl hunting and conservation and everything else. But the kennel field also was a big pheasant hunting field that we occasionally planted. Uh, strips of uh, 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 grain crops in, um, but that was, an, uh, you'd be coming back on this side of the hatchery road, come back down this way, and usually there were a lot of pheasants right in this he hedgerow thicket right here, but, and since we're on private property, there was no limits about being 500 feet from a house, so just, just don't shoot the house, but you know, you'd get right to the end here and some pheasants would go out over the pond and you'd shoot out that way or whatever, so. But anyway, this, in your nomenclature, is known as Gill's House. But this is really the new annex, okay? And I've got some information about both the new annex and the old annex, all right? The new annex had eight, only eight rooms in it, eight double rooms, all right? Four on the bottom, four on the top. And they were rather large and rather lavish. And we did get in there quite a bit to move furniture or, you know, Mr. McKim is coming and he needs his fly rods out of his closet, you know, bring him over to the main house or whatever. And so we, we did get in this building a fair amount. And um, again, I have a roster here that, you know, you should probably have in a folder somewhere. It shows the names of the members that had each one of these rooms and they were more expensive and more, again, more lavish than what's over in the old annex. But these were double rooms and you could have your wife or whomever, you know, in these rooms. Whereas in the old, in the new annex, or the old annex rather, they're all single rooms and it says men only. It says right on the thing, men only. So women could stay here, but not in the other annex. So uh, this would have been the preferable place to have, but only eight of them were available, so. Let's take a walk over to the main house and we'll take her from this end to the other end, build room by room, so to speak, and we'll finish up down there. We're now coming into the uh, ladies' quarters of the main house, which is an area that's been the most changed, shall we say, in terms of the uh, functions that are now being performed here. And there are uh, some environmental centers and so forth going on here. But in those days, ladies, and men stayed in separate quarters on the club. So there's four rooms here that were the ladies' quarters, including a sitting area, a dining area, and I think another, another sort of room to relax in. This is an area where I spent the least amount of time in, as you one might expect. First of all, there wasn't much to do as it wasn't used very frequently, but occasionally we had to move a piece of furniture or maybe, uh, you know, uh, do some painting or something like that. But we, we didn't really get in here very often. But when ladies came to the club, they had to stay in these quarters, men from the main dining room down the other way, which we're gonna spend a fair amount of time in talking about those rooms. This is one area that the Friends group has uh, really uh, taken heart to and set up as it was back then. This is obviously the ladies dining room. The other rooms, which were the sitting rooms, have been converted into other uses. But this is set up very nicely, pretty close to how it was used back in, in those days. And I might point out that back here, 
there's an entryway into all the kitchen facilities. So we're going to talk about the kitchen, but the wait staff could access the ladies' quarters through this back door and would access the men's main dining room through a separate swinging door going the other way. So uh, this was very convenient for them to serve whomever might be dining in here. Now we come into the main dining room, which was again for men's use only, except for one day of the year, which was the New Year's, the New Year's Eve uh, dinner. Um, there were three or four special occasion dinners here. One was the night before the opening of trout season. Uh, the other was uh, the night before the opening of duck season. And at that time, you might have 15 or 20 members here having dinner in preparation of the exciting day that they were going to have the next morning for the opening day of those respective sports. The rest of the time, uh, and the billing that I have records of reflects this, you might have guests here for either lunch or dinner uh, for maybe three or four different members at a time, you know, having a chat, having lunch together. Maybe they planned it that way. Maybe they didn't. It just happened. But uh, that was typical, during, particularly during the trout season. On the duck season, it was more common that you'd have breakfast served here because we had to be ready to go by 6 in the morning. So breakfast was served here, and you might have uh, 8 or 10 sports ready to go for duck shooting on any given morning. So they'd all be having breakfast, obviously, before they went out. And it, the duck shooting was such that it would end at 11 o'clock. You'd come back and they'd have lunch. Some of them would take off, call it a half a day. Uh, there was also an afternoon session for duck hunting. So after lunch, we would sometimes have sports that we would have to rally with outside, be ready to take them at 1 o'clock back to hunt until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So, but this main dining room, again, has been set up in a way that it's, it pretty much represents uh, what it looked like back then. Of course, the woodwork is all preserved and ceilings and everything else. So it's pretty much the way it functioned, with the exception of some of the decor. Um, but we do have pictures of you know, what was here. So there's a possibility that uh, it might be found you know, somewhere along the line. Some of these pictures are reflected right here on the wall, and I have, I have others. So by looking at those, we might even be able to find uh, some particular artifact that uh, is out there that should come back here someday. Now let's go into one of my favorite spots, the kitchen. And we'll tell you all about what went on in there. The kitchen certainly was one of my favorite spots and it was really one of the friendliest and warmest parts of the club because something was always going on in the kitchen, whether it was breakfast, lunch, or get people getting ready for a, a major dinner. So it's set up essentially the way it used to look with the exception that over here were big stainless steel sinks where the dishes were done. But you can see that stove, and that's the stove we actually used even into the 60s. And again, it's a great place to come, the smell of bacon emanating through the whole place, or a pie, or whatever. And it was, it was a friendly place. Everybody gathered here. The, uh, the house staff was coming and going because they were serving meals or maybe taking a break. Obviously, we weren't in here all the time, but. We might come in in the morning if it was uh, in the winter time. We could get a cup of coffee in here. We're always welcome to come in, You'd get a cup of coffee with whole cream, I might add, F purchased from Westbrook Farms, which was where Grumman now is. That whole area was one big farm, dairy, primarily a dairy farm, and they had turkeys and chickens and other items for sale there on a narrow two-lane Sunrise Highway, and everybody shopped there. But And the produce for this facility and this whole club was all purchased locally from places like Westbrook Farm, Indian Neck Farm, uh, uh, all kinds of tradespeople throughout, throughout the East Iceland, uh, whether they bought uh, fish from Iceland, uh, seafood or oysters, clams. And so something always going on here in the kitchen. Again, it's set up pretty much the way it was. But <clears throat> this room, which is kind of off, off limits at the moment, was the helps dining area. So when we took a break, we might come in here to sniff what was going on or steal a piece of bacon off the stove. But we were basically in there uh, conversing and having a good time. And so you had, uh, again, the uh, house staff, which would consist of uh, several different ladies. Uh, Patty Stafford was the chef. Uh, Blanche Shea was a waitress. Uh, Maria Huck was a waitress. Um, 
Jean uh, was primarily involved in uh, cleaning the rooms and, and so forth. But you know, when they were taking a break, you'd come in and you know, I enjoy talking to these folks. They were all from East Islip or, or Bayshore, furthest perhaps. The other older guides rarely came in here, Frank and Willie. Willie, of course, lived upstairs over on the other side, but they rarely came in here. But we would be in here, and then Gil would come sneaking through the back room and want to see what was going on. And so this was always a warm, friendly place to, uh, to fraternize in the, any time of day. And the other reason that this was uh, such a great place to uh, hang out, over in this corner of the room was the refrigerator and the freezer where all the food was kept. And uh, again, it was a very friendly environment here. We were never off limits. If we came in and got a cup of coffee and we needed cream, we could go right in there and get the whole cream ourselves. Uh, it, sometimes in the summer, if we were around, uh, we would get uh, chopped meat, cook ourselves some hamburgers on the stove if uh, nothing was going on. Usually, you know, Mondays and Tuesdays and so forth were quiet. So, but we could come in here and get whatever we wanted. But the one thing that was rarely near and dear to us was, it was in these freezers right here. Gil loved ice cream. All right, ice cream in particular from a firm called T&W or Terwilliger and Wakefield. And we would have ice cream delivered all the time in here. And again, it, it was not off limits. We could go in here and get whatever we wanted. There'd be a half a dozen different flavors in half gallon containers. And we would find these containers around the property with a a, a spoon in it, a metal spoon, a silver spoon, where Gil would take a, his ice cream and be out walking around the property, and he might walk as far as the hatchery with a half gallon ice cream, and then when he got done, he'd leave it up there for us to find and bring back, or we might find it in the horse stable, or we might find it, you know, on some fence post somewhere. But he loved his ice cream, and we loved our ice cream, and we had lots of ice cream together. We did have night watchmen on the property. I mentioned before that the doors were never locked, and that's true, they never were locked. You could come in here at 10 o'clock at night if we were on some kind of an escapade and just walk right in the building. And once in a while we'd have some silly thing going on where we might be, be, be that late. But there was a night watchman, and they had <coughs> stations, and I don't know if there's any of them still on the property anywhere, but the, the night watchman would plug a key in that would record the time that he had come by. And there were a couple of them, but the main one was George Collins. And the thing about George Collins was you never saw him. He was like a ghost. He would, he would be there, and he would do his, his rounds and everything, but you never saw him. And I don't know if he intentionally would, would hang back and not want to be seen, or whether you know it, it just was. But he was always there, and he always did his job. I probably saw George Collins maybe two or three times but he was out every night making the rounds. And they would do all the buildings, all the you know, outbuildings and new annex, old annex and so forth, walk over to the mill, and he would clock in so that you knew that he would be, had been by at that time. So that's the way we kept things secure. I don't ever recall having any kind of problem here with you know, uh, outsiders coming in with a theft or breaking any vandalism or anything like that. The main thing was kids trying to fish for trout. You know. Occasionally, an adult would do it, and they'd obviously be more sophisticated about doing it. And uh, I have some friends that would kind of tell me that and, and rub it in a little bit, you know. Oh, yeah, we got in there one night and caught 47 trout out of the hatchery or something like that. And I'm sure they probably did. One time, we had uh, indication that there were some guys coming into the hatchery on a pretty regular basis. So Gil thought we ought to stake out for them that night, and uh, we did. So we had Gil, we had myself, we had Andy Bushor, and we were going to sleep up at the hatchery all night long. And Gil had these things called popper shells, which are from the field trial circuit. A popper shell is, makes a loud bang, but it doesn't throw out any charge, unless you're right in front of the barrel. It just makes a big bang. So we set up all these trip lines attached to shotguns with popper shells in them, and we slept up there all night. And the end result was no one came. <laughs> so we didn't have any guns go off, and we didn't catch any poachers. But uh, it was a fun experience anyway. So OK, this little pantry area was always a hustle and bustle full of activity insofar as it connected to the, to the uh, cooking area up above. 
and then had various places here where all the china was stored and silverware was stored linens and so forth and it connected to both the men's dining room through this swinging door and through another swinging door that went to the ladies' dining room. So this is where the food would be staged in preparation to actually be served. And so it was very convenient to both areas and also back to the kitchen to bring the food from the stove or whatever might have been prepared up above. So there were always two or three waitress, waitresses in here getting ready to serve or serving and uh, um, always you know, a, a nice atmosphere in that the members were happy to be here and enjoyed being here and uh, enjoyed dealing with the staff and talking about uh, how their day had gone. We're coming into the locker room, which again uh, was a very popular place. <clears throat> the, uh, each member had a locker in here and they had a locker in the billiard room, which we'll go into in just a moment. But there's a list of everybody's locker that they had in here in the rod room and in the uh, bar. And there's also some lockers in the cellar, which were not ver gone to very frequently. There's some wine stored down there and so forth. But these lockers were used all the time. And again, everybody had their own and they paid a rental fee for the one they had and they all had numbers on them. And they, uh, the numbers are on the sheet. And of course, if somebody passed away or dropped out, they'd assign it to somebody else. But this room, uh, ran all the way down and was not connected to the next room back there, which is we're going to go into the fish room where we cleaned all the fish. But this room was uh, used by, by us to gather up the, the sports equipment and take it out onto the front porch. And there were rod racks that ran parallel to the ground on the front porch. And you'd put the rods out there and wait for the sport to come out. And of course, we had uh, creels and tackle and so on and so forth, but you would then have a car and pick up the individual and you'd go, a lot of the fishing was done up near the hatchery. Um, you know, there's probably 20 different places to, to uh, fish from if you go up that way and obviously a lot of, a lot of fish up that way. So, but um, it was always, uh, always good to, and, uh, to be part of the guiding process here. Obviously, this is the main foyer to the main building. Front door that went out onto the porch that ran the whole length of the floor. And this would be the main entrance where a member would come into the building. There was a guest register here on a small table that was housed right here as they first came in. And what I just wanted to mention about the second floor here is that most people uh, since things changed in the 70s, and that's quite a while ago already. It's uh, almost 50 years ago already. Everybody assumed that Gill's office was over there or over there. Gill's office was right there at the top of the stairs. And so when you came in, Gill was sitting right there. All right? And Gill was a, a very intelligent guy. He read volumes and volumes. He read newspapers every day. And his typical routine would be that he'd be out early in the morning, and sometimes we'd be with him. If he, if he said, you know, you want to go birding, we'd go up to the hatchery and, and spend a nice day in May looking for warblers or something like that. But usually by 9 o'clock or so, he'd be back in here, and he had volumes of work to do. I can, you can, I can realize that now by the correspondence that's been generated, the records that had to be correlated and kept, and uh, numerous letters on issues that had to be taken care of as far as maintenance and everything. So he would spend a good part of the day there and, and come out later in the, maybe right after lunch or early afternoon. And as I explained before, by, by three o'clock, we were on horseback for the uh, end, end of the day. So, uh, but Gill's office was right there. And then you, you went up the stairs and the accountant, accountant's office was the first door on the left. And then, again, a little known fact, Gill's bedroom was in this building, and it was the second door up on the left. And so he did not move to the new annex until the state took over the, the facility. So Gill lived in this building, ate in this building, worked in this building. He was the lord of the manor. And so uh, uh, on a few occasions, when Gill would go away salmon fishing in June, and by the time I had proven myself, 
he would want me to stay here in the house for security. So I would stay in Gil's room uh, for a week, uh, nights, and uh, then come down, eat in the kitchen, go to work, just like I was the lord of the manor. So, and I did that, I think, two, two, different, two different summers. Uh, so that was a pretty unique experience as well. And then there was, on this floor, there was a, a the bathroom facilities for the members right in this corner, as well as down the hall, there was a bathroom facility for us worker bees. And I'll show you in the back, the room where we cleaned all the trout and put everything uh, in freezers for all the members and so forth. And before we do that, we'll just turn around and take a quick look in the billiard room here, which is a pretty well-known room. The billiard room is extremely famous because it was the center of activity for the men who were here to relax after a day's hunting or fishing or, or while they awaited uh, breakfast to be or lunch to be prepared. Um, some of the things that were original and near, to, near and dear to our hearts were this bar, all right, and these liquors. Every member had a liquor locker and they could store their liquor in there. They had uh, a key. Half the time, some of them were open. The key was just right there. That wall down there was also liquor lockers, so that's been removed for whatever reason and replaced with those glass sh showcases. The refrigerator was uh, near and dear to our hearts because we could go in there and take a Coke in the afternoon. Again, the bar was there. That was there. The, lock the lockers were there. And... Uh, <clears throat> The, this desk represents, or you know, podium represents uh, a register where the members would record uh, the trout that they had caught, uh, when they were here, uh, different things that were, they were official recording that other members could come in and take a look at and see exactly what had, who was here and what had gone on. And I've got volumes of these records by the, for the years when, when the Connecticut River Club was here. And then Gil, for some reason, Gil saw fit to k keep everything from the, from the CRC. So I have all of those years from 65 and so forth, records of who caught what trout, who, caught, who shot what ducks, who was here uh, for lunch, for, for dinner, whatever. Uh, this photo here does show the other tier of lockers that was over there with one glass cabinet over the top. So at least uh, some of these pictures are authentic. And the big Franklin stove and the big easy chairs were all part of it that were, uh, that were here. Another job we had, I don't remember if it was every year, but certainly we did it three or four times, was to pickle this floor. All right, we had to move everything out of here, and we had to bleach the floor with, uh, I don't remember exactly what it was, but one of the things that sticks in my memory was pine sol. Gil loved pine sol. So, we bleached it, I think, first, and then we put pine saw on it so it had a nice aroma of uh, preserved wood. But we had to do the floor in here several different times. And <clears throat> I think that's it closed off, if I'm not mistaken, is where we used to keep Bill Spadaro happy by bringing firewood. And there was a big box on the outside, so we would take the firewood from the uh, ice house, bring it over here, uh, again, early in the morning, so everything would be, be done. So we'd show up at 8 o'clock, you know, we'd check in, and we'd have our appointed rounds to do four or five different things that had to get done pretty much every day. So we'd make sure the, the wood box was filled with wood. And, and he used to have a saying, don't bring me any toothpicks. Toothpicks, he had a little bit of a, you know, speech impediment, and he didn't want small wood, he wanted big logs. Don't bring me any toothpicks. So we said, what are we going to do with them? So you're going to get some toothpicks along with the big stuff. So that was Bill Spadaro. But he was the, this was his domain. And again, he, once in a while, he and Gil had differing opinions about what should go on. But he was the, the, the house manager, if you would. And uh, if somebody needed a drink, that was his job to make a drink, get a drink. If they wanted a deck of cards, whatever it might be, that was Bill Spadaro's job as house manager here. So again, a major center of activity for just about anybody that would come visit to at least stick their head in here and see if other members were here and have a conversation or record what they had shot or, or caught that day. Back in that day, we still had black rotary phones, all right? And uh, 
I remember when we moved to Oakdale, we had a party line, and you actually had to get the operator uh, to place a call. And then shortly thereafter, it went to, uh, well, East Islip was JU1, and Oakdale was LT9. But there was a phone in this corner, and the members had to pay for each phone call. So there was a little slip that they had to fill out if they called Manhattan or if they called Southampton or whatever and sign it and so forth. So I think that might have been one of the only phones in the, in the, entire, in the entire place. Coming in the building this way was an area that was uh, very important for uh, us worker bees. Uh, we'd come have our, park our vehicles back here and come back in this way. Uh, and this room is pretty much intact. There's a few things that are missing. There was a half wall here so that you could not see those lockers. And you could hear what was going on over there, but you couldn't see it. But the main activity was this sink of which, and there was also right here a table that had two rolls of paper on it. It had wax paper and then heavy brown paper. And you'd come in, and after recording how many trout you'd taken at what location and so forth, our job was to clean the trout which was, is very easy on a trout because they don't have to be scaled, they don't have big scales, and we would leave the head on for the presentation. And so all you had to do was slit up the belly and grab them behind the gills and rip the whole thing out and you were done. And then you'd wash them off here, but you might have 20 fish to do or 30 fish to do or whatever. Wash them here, then you'd wrap them in paper, label whose they were, or put them in an open tray if they were going to have some for dinner, put them in an open tray for, for a presentation. They could select which ones they wanted. But if you packaged them up and they were going to be frozen, there was a freezer in that corner. And you'd then put them over there, and they'd be ready to go. Quite often what would happen with the trout fishing is they'd fish in the morning. They'd come in. You'd clean their fish. They might stay for lunch. By that time, they'd come back. The fish were cooled down, packaged up, and in the freezer, they'd grab them, and off they'd go back to the city or wherever they came from. The freezer was also used for the frozen pheasants and the frozen ducks because they obviously take up a lot more room for the bird being that big. To put 40 or 50 pheasants in a pile is, you know, like that. So they were staged in a big freezer, which is no longer at the hatchery because that building burned down. But there was a big walk-in building that was all freezer at the hatchery, and so we would occasionally have to go from house manager Bill Spadaro's direction I need 10 ducks for Mr. Jackson, who's going home at 4 o'clock this afternoon. So we'd go up to the hatchery and bring back maybe 20 ducks so that he would have his 10, and then there'd be 10 extra ones there for whoever wanted that. And same thing with frozen pheasants. And they were solid blocks of ice by the time they were ready to be drilled in. So you'd, that was an easy job. You just had to round them up and bring them in there. So that's the, what we used to do. So we spent a lot of time in here processing either the trout or the ducks, frozen ducks and pheasants and so forth. And this was a, an area that, again, was uh, frequented by all the guides. Willie would be in here, Frank, Bob, myself, Bob Giffen, whomever. So another place. So between here and the guides room that I showed you originally and some of the chores that we had in and around this general area, there was always something to do, always something to keep us busy, always something to keep us happy.